We begin our chapel today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today is 797 verses 1, 2, and 3. Our reading today is a continuation of the book of the prophet of Daniel, and we'll be reading in chapter 11 today. So if you haven't opened your devices or your Bibles, do that right now to Daniel chapter 11, please. This is a lengthy reading and is a continuation of Daniel's vision that began in chapter 10, which we examined last week. The continuation of this vision was delivered to Daniel by an angel from God and tells in amazing detail 
what the next 375 years or so held for God's people. The prophecy possibly even extends to today with descriptions of the struggles that God's people continue to endure. Daniel experienced this vision around 536 B.C., early in the reign of Cyrus, who was the first king of the Persian Empire. The empire had toppled the Babylonian Empire and their final king, Belshazzar. Daniel had now served two mighty empires, Babylon and Persia, in positions of great power and influence. But God had not forgotten him or his people. Nor had Daniel forgotten he was first and foremost a servant of God. The Persian Empire, with all of its vast power, influence, and wealth, was destined to fall. King Cyrus had taken control with the fall of Babylon, and Persian power continued to grow through the reigns of his successors, Cambyses II, Bardia, Darius I, and then it hit its peak with the reign of Xerxes I, who was the king during the Old Testament story of Queen Esther. King Xerxes amassed a huge army to invade Greece with disastrous results. There would be more Persian kings after Xerxes for the next 150 years, but the empire began a slow decline, and as was revealed by the angel to Daniel, would give way to the Greeks when Alexander the Great conquered the final Persian king. All these details, which had not yet occurred when told to Daniel, and much more detail was revealed to, David by, to Daniel by the angel as well. Alexander the Great's reign was short-lived, and he died at the age of 32. His vast empire was divided amongst his top four generals. On the map, you can see how it was divided. There was Seleucus, who took in Syria and Babylon, approximately. The Ptolemies went to Egypt and Arabia. Cassander took the Greek homeland, and Lysimachus was uh, placed in Turkey. The prophecy then focuses on the next 150 years of the rivalry between the kingdom of the north, which would be the Seleucids, and the kingdom of the south, the Ptolemies. On the and how they were eventually overtaken by a new power to the west, which is clearly the Roman Empire. Daniel, being a Jew, must have been anguished at the angel's descriptions of what was ahead for his people. Thousands of Jews had already begun to return from their Babylonian captivity. Their homeland, which is described in the reading as the beautiful land, and many more people were to, were to follow. They would be rebuilding their lives in their homeland, their nation, and their worship of the true God. They would be caught in the crossfire of 150 years of warfare and political maneuvering between the kingdoms of the north, the Seleucids, and the kingdom of the south, the Ptolemies. They would be ruled by one nation after another, and surely many would meet very violent deaths, and the challenges to their worship of the true God would be constant. In an abrupt transition following verse 35 of our reading, the final 10 verses of Daniel's vision will give descriptions of the events that the Lord has yet to make entirely clear to us. A new king is described that does not fit the description of the previous kings mentioned in Daniel's vision. Christian biblical scholars have identified this prophecy as the Christian church's struggle with the Antichrist. The Antichrist is described in several places in Scripture in very similar terms, as we will see in the close of Daniel's vision. The Antichrist is described as God's arch enemy, one who exalts himself over God, one who speaks blasphemy, one who attacks the heart of the gospel, the teaching that sinners are saved by grace alone through the works and sacrifice of Christ Jesus. He claims to be the only authorized spokesman for God on this earth. He possesses a low opinion of marital love. He honors things 
as God that are not God and has a fascination with influencing and controlling governments. Please follow along in your books as I read Daniel chapter 11. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings, and that would be kings after Cyrus, will arise in Persia. And then a fourth, this would be Xerxes I, who will be far richer than, richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king, this would be Alexander the Great, will arise, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. And that would be the four generals. The king of the south, this would be the Ptolemies, will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north, this is the Seleucids, to make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. <clears throat> one from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army, larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few, few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person, and history has indicated that this is a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who has not been given the honor of royalty, he will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully and with only a few people he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither, he, or neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. 
he will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy, will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands, this is Rome, will oppose him and he will lose, his, he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to, descent, to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. They will then set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of the wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Om of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of, the, of Egypt with the Libyan, Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So that's the end of the reading. It would have been quite understandable from our viewpoint that Daniel would have been deeply distressed by the words of chapter 11. However, God does not leave his people without hope. The angel's message to Daniel in the next chapter chapter 12, which we'll hear next week, will be a message of victory for God's people. However, even in chapters 10 and 11, which we heard last week and this week, in the midst of the predictions of crossfire that the Jews would be dwelling in, God manages to sprinkle comfort for his people. Several times you heard the words, it will come at the appointed time. This is a comfort to us, as it was to Daniel that God is in control of the events to come. Not only is God in control, 
He knows precisely what is going to happen and when it is going to happen. In last week's reading of chapter 10, the angel told Daniel, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. Although the description of events that he was about, Daniel was about to hear had not yet occurred, in God's omniscience, omniscience, it was as though they were already written in the history books. God knows how it all ends. And God wins. So therefore, we, his people, will win as well and be blessed with an eternity in heaven in his presence. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, in our sinful condition, the depths of your love are a mystery to us. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through your holy word. You have told us in that word that we will experience many difficulties on this earth. Give us the faith to rely on your strength to endure the traumas of this life so that we may gain the free gift of an eternity at your side in our heavenly home through the gift of salvation, through the sacrifice of our, your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Bless our contemplations of your never-ending mercies this holy week as we follow your path and bear our crosses in love for what you have done for us. Amen. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor, favor and give you peace. Amen.